بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ترحب دائرة الشؤون الإسلامية والأوقاف بالشارقة بالشيخ أحمد ديدات والحضور الكريم. Uh, the Department of Islamic Affairs and Awqaf welcomes Sheikh Ahmed Didat and the, uh, uh, the uh, all the who comes to this meeting. And we invite Mr. Abdesalam Abdesattar Muslim to preside over and conduct the meeting. Gentlemen, before uh, beginning the meeting formally, may I invite Sheikh Ahmed Didab to come to the stage and uh, present, grace us with this occasion. Sheikh Taha Ashur to come to the stage and recite a passage from the Holy Quran. Sheikh Taha Ashur. Yeah. 
Sheikh Ahmed Didat enjoys amongst Muslims all over the world that we find a respectable audience rather that this hall is full to capacity. It is said that one man's loss is another man's gain. This proverb has proved true for the presence of Sheikh Ahmad Didat in our midst today is our gain against the loss of Nigeria where he was supposed to be lecturing this evening. But it appears that Nigeria was intent on suffering this loss and the providence in response to our prayers sent him to us as we had not had the pleasure of his eloquent discourse for quite some time. Beginning his life in a country store next to a missionary training center Shaykh Ahmed Dida got his first insight into Christianity and the techniques employed by them for conversion and propagation. It spurred him to a deeper study of Islam to provide rebuttal to false allegation against and answers to misleading criticism often levied on our faith by adversaries. Alone and practically without any means, he took up the Kadgal, lecturing, debating, comparing and challenging other faiths. He challenged the very basis of Christianity in asking, was Christ crucified? Is Bible the word of God? And so on. He demolished Dr. Sharosh in what's God's word, Quran or the Bible. He defeated Robert Douglas on crucifixion and brought Jimmy Swaggart to his doom and has challenged the Vatican.
Sheikh Ahmad Didat has stunned the Christian community, proved the banality and falsehood of other beliefs that go by the name of religion, and is South Africa's first high-technic Muslim missionary to spread the message of Islam all around the world. He has won King Faisal Award for his services to Islam and humanity. This valiant son of Islam is in our midst today and he will speak to us on Islam in Africa. There will be a question and answer session at the end of the lecture. So I respectfully request you all to kindly hear him with patience and attention. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you Sheikh Ahmad Dida. بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ولن ترضى أنك اليهود ولن نصارى حتى تتبع ملتهم صدق الله صدق الله مولانا زين مستر تشيرمان and my dear brothers and sisters before I get into the topic of this evening I'll just give you a brief translation of what I read to you. In the Holy Quran, in Surah Al-Baqarah, that is chapter 2, ayah number 120, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He gives us an eternal reminder about the relationship between us, the Muslims, and the Jews and the Christians. He says, وَلَن تَرْضَى أَنْكَ الْيَهُودُ وَلَن نَصَارَى حَتَّى تَتَّبِيَ مِلَّتَهُ That the Jews and the Christians will never, never be satisfied with you, O Muslims, until you follow the brand of religion. There is no peace for you. If you want peace, go and opt out of Islam and become a Jew. If you want peace, become a Christian or bring them into Islam. There's no sitting on the fence. Either you change them or they change you, otherwise there is no peace. That is the message of this Quranic ayah I read to you. Now coming to Dubai. As our chairman said, one man's misfortune is somebody else's good fortune. My president, F.W.D. Clerk, he went to Nigeria. I read this when I'm in the Sudan, more about Sudan later, but in the Sudan, that the clerk, the oppressor, the one who oppressed the black people for 300 years, who created the system of apartheid, keeping people apart racially, that after 300 years of oppression, now this man goes out and is welcomed into Nigeria with a 21-gun salute. I don't know whether you know. That is the highest tribute you can pay to any royalty or anybody, any ruler, any dignity. If the Queen of England went to Nigeria, she can't get 22-gun salute. She'll still have highest 21. So this oppressor, from my country is welcomed into Nigeria with a 21 gun salute. And he opened the doors for all South Africans. See, it made me happy in a way. Because for 15 years I was sweating to get a visa into Nigeria, the Muslim country of Nigeria. In 1977, in Riyadh, at a WAMI conference, World Assembly of Muslim Youth, they gave me a ticket to go to Nigeria. What for? This is the Christian missionaries have run amok. They're running wild. There's a killing field in Nigeria. 
a small group of Christians called Jehovah's Witnesses. They do not number two million in the world today. They started about a hundred years ago, a sect called Jehovah's Witnesses. They are boasting in their magazine called Awake in 1976 that the second highest number of Jehovah's Witnesses in the world outside the United States where they started a hundred years ago is the Muslim country of Nigeria. The second highest number of Jehovah's Witnesses in the world outside America is the Muslim country of Nigeria. And they are boasting in that magazine that we have 112,000 active workers, mujahids, crusaders in Nigeria. And we will have to admit that though today we had a 1 billion Muslims in the world, we can't produce 10,000 dais. Do you know that? We can't produce 10,000 people who do dawah, propagating Islam to the non-Muslim. We can't produce 10,000. And this little sected group in Nigeria alone, they are boasting 112,000 mujahids, crusaders. So they say, please, go and help our brethren in Nigeria. To me, it was a privilege. I got the ticket. 15 years, no visa. 15 years, no. The Nigerians, they meet me, good people, wallah, good Muslims. They meet me in Mecca, in Medina, in Jeddah, or any conferences everywhere, and they embrace me, and they say, why don't you come to my country? Why don't you come to our country? I say, get me the visa. Get me the visa. No visa. 15 years. Now, when I get the news that the clerk, through the help of the Jews in Nigeria, they have got the embassy there now, in conniving with the Christians in Nigeria, they were able to get this Christian oppressor into the country. And he opened the door for me. So I make a beeline for the Nigerian embassy in Sudan, in Khartoum. I said, look, my de clerk is welcomed into your country with a 21 gun salute. I don't want any gun salute. I just want to get into Nigeria. He said, look, we have just got a circular telling us that all South Africans from now on will be welcome into Nigeria. I said, right, give me a visa. So our brother, he gave me a visa. It's here in the book. And he did one thing extra. After stamping the visa, he put another stamp saying gratis, means free. Bakshish, no charge. I am a VIP, very important person. Alhamdulillah. So I got the visa. And I make a beeline. I return home, and from there I make a beeline for Nigeria. 15 years of effort. Now, Allah has now paid me for it. The thing is done now, the door is open. So from Durban to London, and London to Kano. I land in Kano, the Muslim majority area in the north. There's a Kano state, and the city also is a city of Kano. I land in Kano. I get into the terminal building and I get a welcome from the officers there, you know, with all the badges. Come, come, one side, one side. VIP treatment, I think, one side. People, they recognize me, Mr. D. Dad, Mr. D. Dad, they want to come along and, mm -hmm. they say, no, no, shh, don't come anywhere near Mr. D. Dad. Maybe they're trying to protect me from my fans. At times, that's necessary. Your passports, please. So my passport and my son's passport and another companion from England, three passports we hand it over. Maybe for special treatment. Don't waste your time in the queue. Special treatment. After half an hour, they come back with a cyclostyle document that you are a prohibited immigrant. I said, I don't, I'm not an immigrant. I don't want to come into your country. I'm only a visitor, I'm a tourist. I want to come and help my brothers. He says, no, you are not allowed. Here it is the officer, you know, in charge of the immigration, his past his judgment. But the people who are giving me this notification, they are crying. The Muslim who is doing the job, he's crying. They are crying, Allah, they are crying. Tears, genuine tears. What can we do? We are slaves. We have to listen, obey the orders of our superiors. If not, we'll be fired. Here. They're crying. So 
they stop the plane, don't let the plane go until these guys are put back onto the plane, back onto the plane, 18 hours, total flight, make a good run, one tawaf, and back to London. What shall I do? I promised my family two, two weeks. I want permission, two weeks. They gave me permission, two weeks. In two days, I'm back in London, completed the circle. What shall I do, return home? Or where? So I phoned Abu Dhabi. I said, look, I'm here. What do you suggest? He says, please, come to the UAE. Ahlan wa sahlan. I ring up Dubai. He says, ahlan wa sahlan. Please, as a visa. No problem. So I'm here. I'm here. The newspapers, naturally, they want to know anybody coming in. They want to know interview. They want news. So I get the reporters coming along and I give an interview about exactly what I told you. I said, look, I have been kicked out, footballed, blackballed out of Nigeria and they kicked me so hard I landed in the UAE. Hmm? I'm quite happy, but now I said, look, I landed here and the world must know that the Muslim country of Nigeria, they allowed the oppressor as they welcome him with a 21 gun salute, but a Muslim brother wants to go in and he is kicked out. The world ought to know, the people in the UAE wants to know, I'm sure the whole Muslim world wants to know why this Didat got kicked out of Nigeria. He landed there and football. Why? So the interview is given. I show the interviewer the passport, I show him the visa, he takes a picture. And he produces the picture. With the, the story I told him, nothing to do with the story. Here is a picture in color. They did me a favor in technical, four color job. Ahmad Dida showing the passport, the visa. The picture is there. But what is the story about? What does it say? The heading it says, Rushdi is a hypocrite, says Dida. surprising. I'm telling people, look, I'm telling you now, I don't kick dead donkeys. I think a donkey that is dead, I don't go and kick the donkey. That's a disgrace on me, man. Wasting my energy on a dead donkey. The guy's finished, he's gone. So Rushdi, he's finished. You know, he must be cursing the day he was born. Now you want me to go and kick him? You want me to go and kick him? I give battle to living people. I said, the Pope, come, come, come. You want to have a dialogue? Come. Have a dialogue with you. Jimmy Swaggart says, come. Who? Who? Who wants to talk to me? Come. I offered my service in, 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 in Malaysia. All the bishops, whoever you are, whatever church or denomination, please come and have a dialogue with me. I want to talk. Everybody is talking about dialogue. The Pope says, dialogue, dialogue, dialogue. I said, come, let's have a dialogue. And all get cold feet. I don't go and kick dead donkeys. So I found the Gulf News. And I want to know now, where does Rushdie fit in? It is me who is blackballed from Nigeria. I am kicked from all over from there to land in Dubai. That is news. Didat barred from Nigeria. That's news. I am sure you like to know that. What happened? Why? And there is nothing about it. Not one word. The passport shows. What am I showing the passport for? Not one word. So I phone as I want to know who is responsible for this. So they tell me there is Mr. Disa. He is the deputy night editor of the Gulf News. So I'd like to speak to Mr. Disa. Mr. Disa, I thought Lisa, you know, Mona Lisa. I'm thinking, I'm thinking, I said now. What are you? Mr. Disa I said, where you come from? This sound. He's Gabriel, Jibrail. He's Jibrail. He's Gabriel. We say Jibrail. He's Jibrail Disa. So I'm asking him, I says, what is this, man? I'm showing the passport. I'm talking about the passport and you talk about Rushdie. No connection whatsoever. He said, look, the Khalid time had touched it, the subject. So therefore, we won't touch it. Is that what you do? There are so many things, Bosnia, what's happening in Bosnia? It's because the Khalid time has it, I won't have it. Is that your policy? Rajanish, Rajanish died. 
that confidence trickster in America, and you had a two page full from one end to the other, his history. So Khalish time, if it has it, you won't have it. Is that the case? Murarji Desai. Murarji Desai. My mamu. My maternal uncle. Yes, yes. You know, he's my nation. Actually, he's my nation. Murarji Desai. We speak the same language. There are Muslim Desais, Hindu Desais. Muslim Patels, Hindu Patels. Muslim Bhula, Hindu Bhula. I am a Banya Musalman, me. Murarji Desai is my Mamu. Look, he's a Hindu, he's a Mushrik, but I can't say, look, he's not my nation. He's my nation, he's my race, he's my blood relation. Ethnically, we are one people. Murarji. And they put the news about him that he is, he is promoting self-urine therapy in the Gulf News, meaning you drink your own piss. He says, Morarji Desai, my mom says, that is good for you. It's good for cataract. You don't only have that parda coming over your eyes, cataract, and it's good for tuberculosis. And he's telling the Christians, he says, you too, you must drink your urine, because the Bible says so. Your holy Bible says, you must drink your own piss. I said, where did you get that? And he quotes the Bible. Who Murad Jadesa, he quotes the Holy Bible. Saying the Bible says, drink water from your own cistern. So what is cistern? You know the tank in the toilet. You press the chain and the, it takes away all the rest. He says, cistern. So he says, what is cistern? He says, cistern means your bladder. So it means drink water, means drink water from your own system, means from your own kidneys, meaning your own piss. You Christians, you better do the same because that's what your Holy Bible says. And that's news, Gulf news. But Ahmad did that being blackballed, no, they won't touch it. So I said, now, look, I want to know who's superior to you. You are Gabriel Disa. I said, where are you from? He said, I'm from India. I said, India? That's where I come from. Where about in India? He said, Goa. He said, I said, you are a Goanese. He said, no, 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 I'm a Goan, not a Goanese. I said, okay, you are a Goan, Goan, Goan. I said, now, who is your superior? I want to talk to him of what you have done to the news. He says, he is Mr. Nahal Canera. Canera. I said, Primo Canera. I remember the guy, he was one time the heavyweight champion boxer of the world. He was an Italian. Almost seven foot giant. The tallest boxer who ever won the championship of the world was Primo Canera. I don't know those who follow. I was as young man, I was following all these things, you know, Primo Canera. I said, Canera? Italian? He said, no, 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 no. He's a Sri Lankan. I said, oh. How do you spell it? He says, K-A-N-E-I-R-A, Canera, not C-A-N-E-R-A, Canera. I said, oh. I'm asking, is he a Christian or a Buddhist? He said, I don't know. I said, now please don't tell me that. A Christian, you're working with a, another person for so many years as your superior, and you don't even ask him whether he's a Hindu or a Buddhist or a Christian or a Muslim. You never asked him, you don't know. The guy starts getting rough with me. He said, now this old man, what can he do now? <laughs> I said, now who is superior to him? I'm finding out who are the people there in the Gulf news who are controlling the newspaper so i find the guy who footballed me in the gulf news was a christian from india from goa and his superior happens to be a, a buddhist i found out later he's a buddhist then the night editor is rama chandran a hindu and a general manager is a chandra rai another hindu and marketing manager is a Dulip George, maybe a Christian or a Hindu. And who is the circulation manager? Mr. Vikram Dar, another Hindu. 100%! The whole thing is in charge, but who is the head? Who is the owner? Oh, then you find out that, you know, our oh, Muslim brother is the owner. He is the owner. The owner is Brother Umaid, Sheikh Ubaid, who made a tire. So I'd like to speak to him. 
I want to speak to the owner now. Because the, everything is the Hindus and the Christians are controlling the whole newspaper. I want to know my brother, that, do you know what's going on? What they're doing to me? I only want to cry. I want my brothers to sympathize with me for being footballed out of Nigeria. That's all. I want nothing more than that. I don't want you to apply sanctions against Nigeria, that you stop your trade relationship with Nigeria, nothing of the kind. I just want the people to know that I'm hurt. That is all. So Brother Ubaid, who made a tire, they tell me that he's gone to South Africa. <laughs> no, they say, say, what an irony, imagine. I said, look, if I had known, I would, they, the team of businessmen from Abu Dhabi, I'm sorry, from Dubai, they have gone to South Africa. At the moment, they are receiving the hospitality of the South African government. The same white man who has been oppressing us, and he's welcoming our team from here. I said, nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with that. They're enjoying the hospitality of the white man. I said, if I was there, I would have welcomed you. Welcome them all. Ahlan wa sahlan. What a beautiful expression. This morning's paper in the Khalid Times, you read that tourists are finding themselves very, very accommodated here. Tourists. And they're flocking in, alhamdulillah. Good business. Good for business. Tourists. And the heading says, that the tourists are coming because of the hospitality, our hospitality, says Ahmad. Says, it only says in the headline, says Ahmad says that it is our hospitality that is bringing people in. I find out who is this Ahmad? This is Sheikh Ahmad bin Sayyid Al Maktoum. Mashallah. I said, How did you get this hospitality? It's a part of the Arab nature. Where did you get it? It is your expression, ahlan wa sahlan. Anytime, this creates a mentality, ahlan wa sahlan. The most beautiful words of welcome in any language. Ahlan wa sahlan, family and play. Just think that you are a member of the family and be at ease. You, there's no formalities required from you. Sit down, man, sit down. Make yourself feel at home. If you want to pick your nose, go ahead and do it. You don't have to make and no protocols, no pretenses. Ahlan, as you are a member of the family. And Sahl, ease. Like in the army or the, or the boy scouts, they say, stand at ease. Now you can scratch your head, you can scratch your beard, you can do what you like. That is Ahlan wa Sahlan. That is your approach to everybody. Alhamdulillah is creating this feeling. But the hospitality which I'm receiving from the Gulf news is not that type of hospitality. I want to see somebody whenever Brother Obed comes. He's coming on Sunday, by the way. I'm leaving tomorrow morning, 6 o'clock. If I was here, if I had a chance, I would go and meet him and ask him for an explanation. I says, Hindus, 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 Christians, Buddhists. I mean, the whole thing is controlled. I want to know who is the owner and are you responsible? As a Muslim, are you responsible or not for their behavior? What they're doing to your brother? For what reason? Why can you ask them any questions? I want to know. I want to find out from my brothers here if there is a local, a person who is a local, I don't like the term local, I don't like the term. Watani or something, whatever, they'll have to think, you people have to think. It's not a good word. I don't like it, local. It's the same thing as a native. He's a native of the, he's a native. Whenever we say native, we think of African. When you say local, I don't know what you think of. Local, what do you mean local? Think, 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 think of a word, something better than the word local, maybe an Arabic word, which might give you a description of what you are, the people of the land. You are the, the person who is welcoming the other person. I'm sure there's a word for that. Huh? No, no, these are all citizens. This must be something special to say, I am a special citizen who is here to welcome the foreigner, the outsider. That's some word. I want a local, no insult. I'm not trying to insult anybody. I want a local who can assure me that he's prepared to go and present my case to Brother Ubaid. I don't know if there is a brother who can tell me, he said, look, I have the guts to go along. I don't want you to go with a gun or with a knife, go and fight him. I don't want any fighting. Just go and put my case to him. He says, look, brother, what is this going on in your newspaper? Is there a local here? I hope you understand my English. Local person, a Dubaian, a person from Dubai, a native of Dubai. Is there one who's prepared to go along and cry for me to Sheikh Ubaid? 
प्लीज पुट अप योर हैंड जजाक जजाक प्लीज I would, I would like my brother before he goes to give your name and your address and your telephone number. And I assure you, the next time I come, I'd like to have a cup of tea with you. <laughs> the subject: Islam in Africa. That is the topic. South Africa. People are rushing. There's money to be made there. South Africa happens to be one of the richest pieces of real estate in the world. Real estate, you know, land mass with its diamond and gold and coal and natural resources, water and land, with cheap labor. Wallah, it's a heaven on earth. We, with all the oppression, we don't want to leave the place. <laughs> you know, Wallah, if they offered me. In Saudi Arabia, I said, "Look, come and live in Saudi Arabia, and we give you a palace here in Saudi Arabia, condition, and we give you ten thousand dollars a month, <laughs> and a condition palace. You come and live here. The condition you live here." I said, "No, just like Allah. Thank you very much. That hell in South Africa is better than your heaven. Allah, I mean it. Your country, look, it's a holy land." Beautiful place, but when I come out, I have to look like this. You know, the glare of the sun, sand, dry dead sand, black burnt mountains. I don't know whether when you went for Hajj or Umrah, when you pass from Jeddah to <laughs> Mecca or to Medina, what do you see? Burnt rocks. All the rocks are black. Sand is not the pure desert sand you think of. Imagine golden sand, nothing of the kind. Black burnt sand over a period of millions of years, and this glaring sun. You know the way you. Jazakallah, Jazakallah. That hell in South Africa is more palatable to me than your heaven in Saudi Arabia. So I'm not here to sell you South Africa. I'm telling you, it has riches you can't imagine. I don't want to give you details. I told you diamond and gold and coal and other natural resources. If they just open the door to India, the whole of India will be there. If they open it to the Pakistan, the whole of Pakistan will be there. If they open it to the whole of Africa, the whole of Africa will be there. I'm telling you. I don't know about the Dubaians. I don't know about the Dubaians. You have a heaven of your own here. That's different. But I tell you, whole of Asia will be there if they just say "Ahlan wa Sahlan," like the Arabs say "Ahlan wa Sahlan." If that can convince anybody, "Ahlan wa Sahlan," sure, there won't be place for us to breathe, to walk. I'm not selling South Africa, but there is another commodity in South Africa. Which we can describe as black gold, black gold. We have gold and diamond and coal, but now I'm talking about black gold. Can you think what it is? Huh? The Zulus. Huh? Zulus. <laughs> yes, the population. The population. Then the Zulus. There are some over 20 million Africans. Among them, there are eight million Zulus. The Zulus are the most militant community in that part of the world. One of the biggest cohesive force, united force, in that part of the world. You want to go and do business with a white man? You want to be a partner in the exploitation of the black man? You will have the money. I'm telling you. But sooner or later, as soon as the African comes to his, stands on his feet, he says, "You, Arab slave trader, you have been." That's what the white man has been programming him. The Arab is a slave trader. The Arab is a slave trader. And terrified. The black man is terrified. Arab. When you say Arab, is yeah, this is the slave trader. The Christian, the white man has already programmed him. Every Arab is a slave trader. You are the guys they say who took the Negroes across the Atlantic. That's a lie. It's the Christian, the white man, took them all across. But they say the Arab, the Arab, the Arab slave trader. Now you come along as an exploiter with the white man. I'm telling you, your capital is in danger. As soon as that guy says, "Look, you have now taken the place of the white man," 
in company with him, in partnership with him, you want to suck our blood. And I tell you, your capital as well as your life and our lives are all in danger. You are welcome. Ahlam, Sahib, Come, man, come. As, don't come as a, sir, as a guest of the white man. Come on your own steam. The country is open for you. Come as a guest of the Muslims. And do. You are free to go about and meet Butelezi, the Zulu chief. Meet ANC leader Mandela. Meet anybody, everybody. Talk to everybody. Don't go along as a stooge or the tail of the white man. You will get suffocated. And when you come along, you want to do business, try and involve the black man in that business of yours. And that black gold needs this gold. He needs a message. The white man did a beautiful job. He gave them a book and took away the land. The, he gave them the Bible and took away the land all over and made them satisfied. He gave them churches, different, different, separate, separate churches. You can't have your, you can't go and pray with the white man. You can't go and pray with the colored. You African, you have your own church. Different language group, different churches. You can't also pray together. You are an Anglican, you are a Lutheran, you are a Presbyterian, you are a Seventh-day Adventist, you are a Jehovah's Witness, you are a Roman Catholic. Shh. He divided the African into 3,000 different sects and denominations. He's done a beautiful job of divide and rule. But he used the book, the Bible, in his own language. He's given the Bible to him in his own language. And in every dialect of the land, Bible is available. Now, if we want him to change, we have to give him a book. The white man gave him a church, a separate church, and a book. We also gave him a separate a church and a book. The church means the place of worship. We have more than 400 masjids in the country. We say they are open to all, at all times. Ahlan wa sahlan. Our masjids are open to all. Whether black or white, rich or poor, open to all at all times. So the masjids are there. When we need more, we'll build them. But 400 masjids we have in the country at the present moment. What about the book? We have just succeeded in producing the first part of the Holy Quran in Zulu. My little society, we did 100,000 so far. 100,000, we say in Urdu, 1 lakh, 8 lakh. Sounds like a million. It's not a million. 100,000. Now, we want 1 million more copies of this book. 2 million more copies of this book to give it to the Zulu. And I want our brothers in your, this part of the world, you want to do business? I said, you need an insurance policy. Any business? You want an insurance policy. You want to secure your, your capital. You need an insurance policy. I said, this is the insurance policy. With Allah and with mankind. You win the guy's heart. That this is my brother. The Arab is rich. He makes me happy. He's my brother. He's my brother. He's well to do. He's got a Mercedes Benz. Alhamdulillah. He's got his own private planes. Alhamdulillah. Allah has blessed him. He's my brother. Insurance policy. You have to win the hearts and minds of the people. And there is nothing better than Allah's kalam to do the job. We have done the job as a start. First part, we said give it to him. Two million copies, each costing two dollars each. And I'm looking for, I will look for, I'll meet our brother Obey, Sheikh Obey, when I come back. And if I can, Sheikh Maktoum, when I come back. And Sultan Muhammad Qasimi of Sharjah, when I come back, inshallah, I said, look. I want your help in this. Do business, but in the insurance policy. This is the insurance policy you must take out. The Christian, he's doing the job. Wallah, he's doing the job. Unimaginable. You remember I told you a little while back about the Jehovah's Witnesses. A small group of people, not even two million in the world. Among so many other things. They produced 84 million copies of this one book in 95 languages. You hearing all right? What I said, 84 million! <laughs> it's, it's hard to believe. It's 84 million copies of one book. They call this book the truth that leads to eternal life. 
And that book is not a booklet. This is called a booklet. You know, a little book. That book is 192 pages. How many they produced? 84 million. In what languages? What language you want? Arabic? They got it. Urdu? They got it. Zulu? Come on, come on, man. Swahili? What language you want? In 95 languages. Can we Muslims compete with that? With that one little sect, one little group? Can we? Let's bow our head down in shame and acknowledge that we are nowhere, nowhere in the picture. We are not fit for the work Allah Bari Ta'ala has in appointed us to do. We are not fit. We are nowhere near anything what the Christian is doing. The Bible, the Holy Bible. I'm reading. 800,000 Bibles sent out. Art lack. Scriptures in Afrikaans, English and Zulu were most in demand. Mr. Fanda Merva said 210,933 Afrikaans, 191,500 English, 11,070 Zulu, 814,000 Bibles distributed in bulk, and they're talking about 3 million scriptures by one Bible society alone. 3 million pieces of literature by one Bible society in one year alone. We are only asking for one million of these. Maybe last as a year or more. One million of these. Here, a Christian gift free to all Muslims. It's not for Hindus, not for Jews, not for other Christians, but for you, Muslims. A Christian gift free to all Muslims. The Holy Bible, the Word of God. What you have to do? Just fill the coupon. It says here, application for a free Bible. You have to say, yes, I am a Muslim. And I would like to receive a free copy of the Holy Bible. Just put your name and address and you beggars will get it free. All you beggars, you get it free. You just write for it and you get it free. We say, we want to give this to this black gold. The black gold in South Africa is the African. And among the African, the biggest powerful force are the Zulus. Give him this book and make him our brother. The Christians have produced the Bible in 2,000 different languages. <laughs> it's unimaginable. Wallah, 2,000 different languages. They have 11 different Bibles for the Arabs alone. <laughs> for the Arabs, there are 11 different Bibles for the Arabs alone. What do you want to do with different, 11 different Bibles for Arabs? To me, there was one, only one Arabic, the Arabic of the Quran. There was one, only one Arabic language. That is the language of the Quran. That's what I thought. But now the Christians are telling me, no, these Arabs, they, they speak different dialects, different lahja. The Syrian, the script is different. Moroccan, different script. Tunisian, different script. Palestinian, different dialect. South Sudanese, different dialect. I didn't know all that. Here are samples from the Christian magazine, the Gospels in many tongues, 11 different Arabic Bibles. This is the trouble they have taken for you. I want to know what are you doing for them? Nothing. Nothing. The South Africans, they are now going to distribute 10 million free Bibles. 10 million. Our de clerk, with government money, that's our taxpayers' money, he's going to contribute 1 million. And the British and Foreign Bible Society will give 9 million more. 10 million Bibles they want to distribute. We are only asking for 1 million of these little books here. That is all. The South Africa says, Red China to get Bible press. Look, they're thinking ahead, ahead. The clerk is going to Russia now. Do you know that? He's in Russia. To do what? Not only to do business with the Russians, man, Bibles, Bibles, he's thinking about his Lord, his mission. The white man is thinking wherever he goes, he wants to do business and he wants to propagate his faith. We want to go and do business and we sell our souls. Our souls are sold out. We go for a good time. 
Where? To Bombay? Huh? Beirut? Huh? Bangkok? What do you go there for? To preach Islam? To propagate Islam? Your forefathers, I'm telling the Arabs, they did a beautiful job. Allah says, do business. Allah wants us to do business. Our Nabi Karim Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, do business. Even if you have to buy and sell needle and thread. Sweet, sweet haga. Even if you have to buy and sell needle and thread, do business. The Arabs, Alhamdulillah, they went out in the sailing boats, they came to my part of the world, in India, Surat district above Bombay, they came to do business and in the process they converted my ancestors. They went to Malaysia to do business, in the process they converted the people. They went to Indonesia, they did the same. They went to China and 50 million Chinese are Muslims. No Muslim army went there. East Africa, up to Mozambique. The Arabs did the job. He went to do business and he spread Islam. On the west coast, he went to do business and he spread Islam. That's your forefathers. I'm telling the Arabs, that's your forefathers. You can't go anymore in by sailing ships. Finish. It's not for you. You've gone too soft. Even in, a, in, a, in, a, in an air-conditioned aeroplane, you dare not go to Borneo. You dare not go to the Congo. You dare not go to the Amazon. You are not fit to do that job anymore. You can't do that job. You know that. In an aeroplane, air-conditioned aeroplane, you can't go to the Congo, I'm telling you. To do propagation, dawa. So Allah sends customers to your door. Look at that. All the Hindus are there. Have you delivered the message? All the Christians are there. All the Buddhists are here. They're seeking for jobs, but you won't talk. You can't go to that country, and they're coming to you here. As workers, they respect you, they look up to you with respect, and you still you can't open your mouth. I want to know why. When the Pakistani comes here, hmm? I'm not talking about the Muslims. <laughs> Sadiq and Bhatti and Zahiruddin Mirza. Sound Pakistani? Is it, is it sound Pakistani? Yes. Who are they? Zahiruddin Mirza is a bishop of Pakistan. He is here eating your food and propagating Christianity in your country. This Sadiq and Bhatti here in Sharjah, he's got his church, the Pakistan Church of Sharjah. He's propagating Christianity here in your country. What are you doing? I want to know. What are you doing? Allah chose you, the Arab, in the first instance, and his language as the vehicle of his message to mankind, the Holy Quran. He chose you and your language. What are you doing? Allah chose you, the Arab, in the first instance, and his language as the vehicle of his message to mankind, the Holy Quran. He chose you and your language. In the first instance, your forefathers did the job, Alhamdulillah. From the Atlantic to the Pacific, they did the job. And they relaxed. 800 years in Spain, they had a jolly good time. Now, Arab brothers, they had a jolly good time. Not heeding the warning. Not heeding the warning. They're reading the Quran. They're doing tilawat the Quran. They're reading Tarawi and they read the Quran and they understand. Allah says, Kam jannati wa uyun. How many of the gardens and the fountains they left behind? Wazuin wa makamin kareem and cornfields and monumental buildings. You see them? Around here. And cornfields and monumental buildings. kanu fiha faqihin and wealth and the amenities of life in which they took so much delight. Kazalika wa auras naha kaumun akharin. Thus other people were made to inherit these things. Fama baqat alayhim as wal ardu wa ma kanu minzareen. And neither the heavens nor the earth shed a tear for them, nor was respite given to them anymore. They read it. They understood what it means. But they were laughing at the Egyptians. Firaun, the fool. <laughs> you know, Allah sent him nine plagues. Look at all the riches he had, the granaries of Egypt, the Nile River, greens, all the silt and the things that they planted and they grew and they have this Abu Simbel and what and what not. They have the mighty monuments there in Egypt. Go and see it even today. The pyramids, they can't understand how they got the things together. That between 50 feet, 50 ton rocks, 
blocks, if you put them together and if there's one inch off on one side and three quarter on the other, how do you get them together? How do you get these things together? The 4,000, 5,000 years ago, how did they get these two rocks together that you can't put a cardboard in between? How? They can't understand. This is what they had. What did they do? They didn't hit the warning. So our brothers in Spain are laughing at the fools in Egypt, Fir'aun and his people. The fools. You see, they didn't hit the warning. Allah destroyed them. <laughs> I'm saying, you fools, we are in the firing line. But no, no, you see the other guy, the other fool. Baghdad, Samarkhan, Bukhara, and the Harun al-Rashid, Mamun al-Rashid, a veritable fairy land. You can only create those scenes in films, that's all. In real life, no more. What happened? On the borders of the Mongols, barbarians. You want to preach to them, Islam? <laughs> what can they understand? What will they understand? Your forefathers could. The most barbaric people on earth, you Arabs. In the Ayyam al Jahiliya, you married your stepmothers. Did the Mongols do that? Did the Spanish people do that? Yeah, wine bibbers. You people excel them all. You are greater drunkards than the Spanish people. They didn't marry the stepdaughters, stepmothers. They didn't bury the daughters alive. You did. The Arabs in the Ayyam al Jahiliya. That given the master historian describes them, he says the human brute, animal in human form. The human brute, almost without sense, is poorly distinguished from the rest of the animal creation. The only thing that distinguishes him from the animal is the form. The form. Fi ahsan taqweem. Allah created him in the best of moles. Otherwise, animal and worse than animal. That's you. And Allah extricated you. He made you the torchbearers of light and learning to the world. It can't do that to the Spanish people? <laughs> no. It can't do it to the Mongols? No. Allah says, Fatarabbasu. You wait. You khabis, you wait. For what? Hatta yati Allah bi amri until Allah's decision comes about for your destruction. And you waited. 800 years. Allah waited and you waited. 800 years. Allah waited for us in India. 1,000 years we ruled India. 1,000 years. And 1,000 years we didn't do the job. Allah says, you wait, and we waited. Today, <laughs> we can't even cry in that country. Do you know that? You can't even cry. Why are you hitting us? You can't cry. Why? You didn't do the job. Allah says, فَتَرَبَّسُوا حَتَّى يَأْتِيَ اللَّهُ بِأَمْرِهِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يَحْدِ الْقَوْمِ الْفَاسِقِينَ You are a fasik people. With all your black patches on your forehead, and your salat and zakat and all, you are a fasik people if you don't do the job. Here, brothers, here a start. Make a start. Make a start. One million, two million Zulu Qurans. Each and every one of you, you can contribute for one Quran. Five Qurans. Fifty Qurans. This million I'm talking about, inshallah, I'll meet somebody with He said, right, okay, inshallah. I might, I'm, I'm very, very optimistic. You see, in all my life, I'm very optimistic. But let's get started. The papers are given to you with the address. He said, look here is somehow you can, if you want to get together, if you can't do yourself $50, $100, $1,000, if you can't, get a few friends together. He said, come on man, you give five, you give two, you give one, we'll put together and we'll send it for Quran, Holy Quran account. The people of Africa, they are the readiest people for Islam. In their concept, the, the Zulu, let's start with the Zulu, that's where I come from, Zulu land. The Zulu, you ask the Zulu that you worship God, he said yes. Before the white man came, you knew about God, he said yes. What is his name in your language? What do you call him? He says, Umvelingangi, Umvelingangi. Sounds like Wallahu Ghani, Umvelingangi. What is he like? Was he like a man or a monkey, elephant or a snake? He says, no, Nimza, sir. He is a pure and holy spirit. He does not beget and is not begotten. And there is nothing like unto him. He is actually giving you a translation of Surah Ikhlas. You ask him, have you read the Quran? He said, what is that? What, what Quran is he in? What is that? No, no, he doesn't know. He never heard the new Quran. In his life, he doesn't know the Quran. You want to give him now? But he's quoting you the Quran in his own language. 
He knew about ethics and morality. He knew that adultery was bad, stealing was bad, lying was bad. All these ten commandments he knew before the white man came. He didn't have a name to his religion because his language was not a written language. The white man did a beautiful job. He gave him a book in his own language and gave him his script, the Latin script. He did the job. I just come from Sudan. I got the visa in Sudan. You remember for Nigeria? Now before going to Nigeria, I'm sorry to Sudan, I have a habit. Call it an obsession. If I am to go to any country, I like to master the language of that nation before going. In 1977, I was supposed to go to Indonesia, so I learned Indonesian. I was supposed to go to Nigeria, I learned Hausa, Hausa Fulani, the language of the Nigerian. You get started, man. I wanted to go to the Lebanon, I learned the Arabic of the Bible. I wanted to go to Israel. I'm afraid that people won't allow me, but I want to go to Israel, talk to the Jews. I learned Hebrew. I learned the Hebrew, language of the Jew. I want to go to Spain, I learned Spanish. In my own country, I, learned speak, I speak Zulu, I speak Afrikaans, and English I'm speaking now. What language you want to hear? What language you want to hear? I want to go to Kenya. I learned Swahili. <laughs> so what language you want to hear? Look, this is my hobby. I love to do that. Acquire some little knowledge about the man's language. So before going to the Sudan, um, I said I knew some Arabic of the Bible. Quranic Arabic I know a little bit more. But the Bible of the, the Quranic uh, Arabic of the Bible. I said now the Dinka. We are at war with the Dinkas. General John Garang is a Dinka. He is like the Zulu. But the Zulu is in South Africa, the Dinkas are in Southern Sudan. And this guy, we are at war with him. So I said, right, we are at war. I said, sooner or later, inshallah, I hope and I pray, and the Muslims are praying that the Muslims gain victory. But I have been telling them when I went there, and I tell you all, that you can win the war and lose the peace. You can win the war, but you lose the peace. You don't know how to consolidate that fellow. You'll ever be at war. You defeat him in the field, but it's a continuous battle and the whole of Africa is behind the black man. And the southern Sudanese are treated as a black man. They are the black man. You Sudanese, you say you are an Arab. Is it a fact? Yes. They say we are Arabs. So I said, look man, you look like an African. No insult, please, please, don't take offense. I said, look, to me you look like an African. I said, yes, but I'm an Arab. I said, okay, okay, but you look like an African to me. And to the whole of Africa, you look like an African. What makes you Arab? He says, you see, our Nabiya Kareem Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said that whoever speaks Arabic is, a, is, a, is an Arab. So that definition, you are Arab. Anybody who speaks Arabic, if all of Pakistan was speaking Arabic, we would be also saying we are Arabs. That's qualification, that definition of a Nabi gave. Whoever speaks Arabic is an Arab. From that point, you Sudanese are Arabs. But from your looks ethnically, you look same like the Dinkas to me. Please forgive me, no insult. But now how are you going to talk to the Dinkas? So I got the Dinka Bible. They tell me there are four different dialects of Dinkas alone. They, they, got four, they got the Bible in the four Dinka dialects of the, for this people, four different dialects in their language. So I got one of them. I said, the one that John Garang, his dialect I want. So somehow I got that. And I learned. And I went into Sudan. I go to the, put up in Hilton Hotel. I go to the receptionist. And I said, hey, you know, I was trying to learn your language. That's how I opened up. Anyway, I said, you know, I was trying to learn your language. He said, yes. I said, listen, he's thinking Arabic, I'm gonna talk. I said, apiat abasin viyaki lik eith, apiat inunuk vik tijal an nasha jil, keidu jil ashibu inunuk vik kunalar ikabatuj inunuk vik. This guy said, that's not our language. I said, Sudanese. He said, no, no, that's the language of the Dinka. I said, oh, he's not Sudanese. Yes, yes, he's Sudanese, but there's a Dinka language. That guy there, that porter, he's a Dinka. So I go to the porter. 
You see? He looks at the same African like the other. I said, yes. I said, you know, I was trying to learn your language. He said, yes. I said, listen, if I'm making a mistake, if I'm murdering your language, please forgive me. He says, that's all right, all right. He said, listen, apiata basin, we akilik is, apiati nunu quick tijal and nasha jin. He's done, he's done, he's done. You know, me, I'm supposed to be an enemy. He was, are you Dinka? That means I'm at war. I want to fight him. You Dinka? You're fighting my people? Hmm? I'm a Muslim. You can see that. You want to fight? I don't want to fight. I said, I'm trying to learn your language. And we all love our language. That's sweet. Wallah, this is the sweetest thing is our own mother tongue. Whatever language it is, how silly it sounds. Your language, my language to me, the sweetest language on earth, my own, Gujarati. To you, maybe Urdu, Arabic. But my language, I love it. So, I, I repeat this to the Dinka, the porter. He corrected me, some pronunciation. So I'm asking him, you people before the white man came, who Christianized them. This guy's a Christian. He's a Roman Catholic. I said, before the white man came, did you have a concept of God? Did you people believe in God? He said, yes. I said, what do you call him? What is the name of God? He said, Nihalik. Nihalik. The Dinka fellows. Nihalik. His name is Nihalik. I said, have you got a statue of him? An image, an idol? He said, no. I said, why not? Couldn't you carve out of wood the shape of a man or a monkey or an elephant or a snake? He said, yes. Or out of clay, could you not have formed a statue? He said, yes. Then I said, why didn't you do it? Why didn't your people make a statue of your God? He says, sir, how can you make a statue of light? He is light. And you call him a kafir. You call him a kafir. You call him an enemist. That's what the white man told you to call him. Is he a kafir? He is telling you, Allah nur samawati wal ard. Allah is the light of the heaven and the earth. The Azul is telling you, Kulhu wallahu ahad. Allah samad. Lam yalid wa lam yulad wa lam yakun lahu kufi. Without using the name Allah. He is telling you, this is our concept. And you say, he's a kafir. 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 Astaghfirullah. This is the sickness we have inherited from the white man. I says, get rid of the sickness. Talk to the guy. And nobody, nobody, I'm telling you, in the Sudan knows the language of the South. Nobody! I have a crowd like this. I said, how many of you know the name of God Almighty in the Dinka language? Put up your hands. So, two guys put up their hands in a crowd of this size. So I said, you are a Dinka. He said, yes. That means he's a convert from Dinka to Islam, so he knows the land. The other guy, I didn't ask him. But in a crowd of this size, only two guys knew the name of God Almighty in the language. And you want to win him over. How? You can't even talk his language. This is sickness with our people. You come along from India, Pakistan, Molvi Sahib, and you stay with us for 50 years, and in 50 years, you don't even learn to say Salaam Alaikum to the other man in his language. To the Zulu, you can't say Sagabawana or Sanbawana, more than one. That, in 50 years, the guy doesn't learn. The white man comes along, and in three months, he learns your language, and he challenges you in your language. He preaches to you in your language. He wants to do a job. You don't want to do a job. April 13, Time Magazine, get it. You read there, in America, there is a section in America where more languages are spoken than anywhere else in the country. America is supposed to be a uni-language country. English, 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 English. But there is an area, multiple of languages are spoken. In America, they tell you where, where. They tell you it is Utah or Utah. Salt Lake City. There is another Christian sect called the Mormons. Mormons. These Mormons in the Utah University of 28, this Mormon University, there are 28,000 students. In among those 28,000 students, there are learning 38 different languages. You teach that in Islamabad? How many? In Umul Qura? How many? Is there Al Ain? How many? Come on, come on. Madina University, how many? In that university, they're teaching 38 different languages. So it makes you wonder why. What are they going to do with the 38 different languages? No, they have a mission. Every Mormon 
gives two years of his life for missionary work. Free. That's his zakat. That is his zakat. Two years of his life he gives for missionary work. So now, while they're studying, they said, right, where are you going to go? So one guy say, I want to go to South Africa. Mm -hmm. What language is they speak? Is they speak Zulu, Tosa, Chwana. Mm. What else? Well, they also speak English, Africans. That's right, I'll take Africans. I'll talk to the white man. So he's learning Africans. One of the youngest of the world's languages, and a small group of four million men, women, and children, their language the guy's learning. Second language. No, I'm sorry, the first one, first one in the list you read. Amazing. He says American Sign Language. You see sometimes in the planes, you know the person is talking and somebody behind is doing like this. He's telling you what, what the person is talking is for the deaf and the dumb. Sign language. Say American Sign Language number one. Second one, Afrikaans number two, three. 38 different languages are listed. Why? They want to do a job. You, you don't want to do any job. You are satisfied. You Urdu follow? Urdu and English because we need English to make a living. And Urdu is your mother tongue. Okay. You Arab? Well, Arabic you are satisfied. You want to learn another language? Yeah, maybe say English. They are learning 30 because they want to do a job. You don't want to do any job. There's some, can you, look man, think man, think. Why is this guy doing that? Why is he doing that? Can we learn from him? Can we emulate his example? And we don't have you to invent the wheel once more again. Go and look at the enemy, what he's doing, learn from him and get on from there. So, I don't know, my dear brothers and sisters, I would rather leave myself open to you for questions and answers. There might be so many things that you want to know about Africa in the field of Dawa or about the field of Dawa in other places here in what's happening in the UAE, what's happening in Saudi Arabia, what's happening in Bahrain and Kuwait. What do you want to know where this confrontation is taking place in India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Indonesia? I am in the field and if I don't know, I'll make it my duty to find out for next time. I'm at your disposal entirely. Wa akhirat dawanan alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Christians are boasting that they have perverted more Pakistanis into Christianity since independence than the previous hundred years of British rule. They are boasting that there are so many cities in Pakistan with more than one lakh Christians each. Karachi, more than one lakh Christians. Lakh means a hundred thousand. More than one lakh Christians. Multan, more than one lakh Christians. Lahore, more than one lakh Christians. Sial Court, with the border with the enemy, more than two lakh Christians. And they are saying that there are so many towns and villages in the Punjab, there are more Christians than Muslims. I went and spoke to Junejo. I don't know what he was then, a few years back. To Junejo in Pakistan. I was giving him these facts and figures in his office. So he called his aides and he's telling them, Pakistan to Islam ka kila hai. Usko, this is getting cracked. The Pakistan is a fortress of Islam and it is getting cracked. And you people are not informing me what's going on. I spoke to Ziaul Haq. Same response. The poor fellow doesn't know what's going on in the country. He didn't know. 
Now, I personally, I said, now this missionary is coming from the outside, what's happening in Nigeria. They get these missionaries, the hot gospel preachers, to come and provoke the Muslims, and the Muslims, because they, have, they don't know how to answer, they get frustrated and they take action into their own hands. Riots taking place. Pakistan is more peaceful as far as that is concerned. Now, to me, I said, every Muslim, he must become a propagator. We must welcome the people to come into your country and give battle to them. But you are not armed, you don't know what to talk. You don't know how to talk. I said, look, learn from me. Look, I'm not a professor, but there's something I can give you. I can give you a survival kit. You know, this is an atom war. You need some survival kit where you can get into some shelter somewhere and you might exist there for a month, two months, you can exist, you can be alive. Survival kit. And I discovered this kit in Sudan. Amazing. You know, wherever I go, I learn something. Something comes my way. In the Sudan. You see, about 10 years ago, I got stranded in Khartoum. I was going from Doha, Qatar to back home. So I'm asking the people, what is the shortest, shortest line to South Africa? So they tell me from Doha to Khartoum, Khartoum to Nairobi, Nairobi to Johannesburg and Durban. I said, right. Are they connecting flights? They said, yes. So I took the flight from Doha, Qatar. Land in Khartoum, no connecting flight. And the Sudanese gave me such wonderful welcome. <laughs> That I cried to Allah, Ya Bari Ta'ala, for this, I want Jannah. Look, I don't say for Salah, Zakat, Hajj, Som, um, but for that, what I went through, the things where they put me in that airport building, what they did to me, I'm crying to Allah, I said, for this, I want Jannah. Not for anything else, for this. I know that's matter between me and Allah. You can ask me, have you a right to talk like that? I said, don't worry about it. That's between me and Allah. I spoke to him like that. I went Jannah for this. And somehow I managed to get out. Two o'clock in the morning. I go to a hotel. Next morning I just turn around and say, let's have a look. I find a university Muslim bookshop. I go there. I want to know whether you get the Quran. He says, no. I send a translation. He says, no. An Arabic Quran. He says, no. University Islamic bookshop. No. What have you got? On Islam, nothing. I fall around. I find Mao's thoughts. Thoughts of Mao. Mao's thoughts. I find the Gospel of St. Mark in the Islamic bookshop. Next door is the Bible Society bookshop. I go there. I say, what Bibles have you got? He said, what Bibles do you want? I said, no, what have you got? What do you want? I said, you got English Bible? He said, yes. You got Arabic Bible? He said, yes. I said, you got Southern Sudanese language? He said, yes. So what do you want? I said, mm, I'm only asking. That was 10 years ago. Now I go again. I'm welcome, alhamdulillah. Now, I make a beeline for the same university bookshop. Have you got the Quran? No. Translation? No. Arabic Quran? No. What have you got? Ah, I found a book, Islam in Africa. That's the subject of this evening's talk. I got that title from there. I'm interested about Islam in Africa. I stand and read abuses on our Nabi Karim written by Christian missionaries, puts Rushdi to shame, or maybe Rushdi got his inspired inspiration from there. And they're attacking the Sudanese in that book. These are barbarians, uncivilized, uncouth people, you know, savages in that book, and they're selling that. I paid 850 pounds for that book. Don't get frightened, that's like 850 cents, American cents. Eight dollars fifty cents. I paid 850 pounds for that book. Next door, Bible Society. I go there, I say, yes. What Bibles you got? I say, what do you want? I say, English Bible? I say, yes. I say, How much? 15 pounds. That's 15 pence. That's 15 cents. Actually, 25 American cents. I say, right. My son says, we buy two case lots. How much? He said, no, no reduction in price. So, for 25 American cents each, we bought two cases of the Bible. Two cases. 48 altogether. Now, I've got the university students. I had given some other course for them. Now, everybody gets a Bible each. Everybody a Bible each. This is your scud missile. 
And I'll show you how to prime it. How to use this. This cut the enemy is throwing at you is making you to swallow it. Now I said how you turn it back on him. Got the Bibles? Everybody. Right? I said now open up. What is this book? This is the Holy Bible. What do you call it in Arabic? Huh? Yes. What is it? Injil. That's Injil. So they said also. Injil. That's right. This is the Injil. I said open the Injil now. First book of the Injil. Called Genesis. Open chapter 19. Got it everybody? Got 19? Yes. Verse 30. Look for verse 30. Got it? Say yes. I'm a teacher. I'm teaching class. Right, read. So it starts reading. Next one. After two verses, you. You. Carry on. And your ears go red. What you're reading. Lut His daughters are seducing him, having sex with him night after night by getting him drunk. That's that. Right? Mark it. Mark it in your book. Prime it. Prime it for use. Same book. Don't go far. Genesis chapter 35. Verse 22. Open. Reuben. One, uh, one of the sons of Yaqub He goes and has sex. Intercourse with his mother. Mark it. Mark it. Prime it. Prime it. You know you have a bomb. You have to prime it. For, for, for propulsion. Right. Genesis chapter 38. Open. Say. Don't go far. The first book of the Bible. Don't go far. First book. Chapter 38. You read about Judah. The father of the Jewish race. From whom we get the word Judaism. Judea. Judah. He goes along and has sex with his daughter-in-law. So I said, you know what you do? You. You. I want you to acquaint yourself with this. Now, any Christian comes to you, you ask him, I says, you know, they want to argue and debate with you, ask him, do you know what is incest? Do you know what is incest? If the guy's educated, you want to preach about it, he knows what is incest. I-N-C-E-S-T, incest. If he doesn't know, you explain. Father and daughter having sex together, that is incest. You go and have sex with somebody else's wife, is adultery, fornication. Right? When you have with your own daughter, that is incest. When you have with your own mother, incest. When you have with your own daughter-in-law, incest. When you have with your own sister, incest. There are more than four kinds of incest in the Bible. I said, let me write a book on incest. The types and types of incest that you can commit. And I want to present it to your daughter. I want to present that book to your daughter. What will you do to me? He said, I'll strangle you. Can God write that? He's telling you how, how, not only he's telling you about others, about himself, about God himself, what he does. This book, the Holy Bible, read it to the fellow man, read it to him, but now you have to acquaint yourself. And you are now a sitting duck. You are a sitting target for the Christian because you don't know the book. I say, open up Genesis, don't go far. Chapter 21, verse 20, chapter 21. Got it? He said, yes, got it. First book of the Bible, chapter 21. I'm reading. I'm only reading to you. But the names I'm going to change for a while. Names. I won't use the names that are written here. Then I'll give you the names. But listen. And Swagat, you know Swagat, our friend, my friend, in America. You know him? And Swagat visited Murphy, Barbara Murphy. You know that prostitute. Now you see, you'll be able to, when you're listening, there's no resistance. If I use other names, you'll say, you'll get tensed up. I don't want you to get tensed up. I want you to just listen first. And I'll, then I'll put the proper name. And Swagat visited Murphy, as he had said. Yes, Avada kya tha, as he had promised, as he had said. And Swagat did to Murphy as he had spoken. Jo kaha tha, as usko kya. And Murphy conceived, she became pregnant. What did Swagat do to Murphy? Hmm? 
What did he do to her that she conceived? Usko bacha, hamal da, hamal se ho gaye. What did he do to her? You know. Now let me put the proper names, as in the Bible. And the Lord, Lord means God, Khuda wa Taala. And the Lord visited Sarah. Ibrahim alayhi salam ke bibi ke pas gaya. Visit her, like you visiting a prostitute. Like Samson visited Gaza, and he saw a prostitute, and the Bible says he went in unto her. So now the Lord goes. The Lord visited Sarah as He had said, and the Lord did to unto Sarah as He had spoken, and Sarah conceived. What did the Lord do to her? What did He do to her? That she conceived. Jo kaha tha vesa kya? And she conceived. This is the Holy Bible. With this, they are catching customers. With this filth and rubbish in the Bible, dude, I can't, I can't even tell you openly. Kya kya likha hai iska? I need a special class, young men who can bear it. And I give you something as a man, plaster this, plaster this on the enemy. Where is this Zahiruddin Mirza? Us khabis ko bulao mere pas. And I want him to read it to his mother. I say, can you read this to your sister, to your daughter? This is what Allah has given you. Allah is telling you, "Kul hatu burhanat." Usko puchho ke tumara burhan kaha hai? Where is your proof? And you're not asking him. If he produces the proof, man, look at it and show him. Ke khabis, you read this to your mother, you read this to your sister, you read it to your daughter, huh? But you don't know anything. You are like a sitting duck. That guy comes and knocks at your door in your own country and makes a mess of you, and you are helpless. In Pakistan, I said, "Damn it all! Why aren't you waiting for him?" Every Christian comes along, invite him home, and show him this. He leave the country and run away for good. Don't blame the government. They have the ramifications. I don't know what. I'm not sympathetic towards whoever this guy is in charge now. I said, "Look, they have the problems. Our government everywhere except for Saudi Arabia. That's the only country in the world, Muslim country, that says no churches, no churches in my country." That's the only country in the world who can boast that. Every other country in the world, we know the mess that they're making of us. So, my dear brothers, we have to go and learn, find out how a Tao Pench, you know, the the karate or the judo that that guy is trying to apply to you, how you can turn the tables on him. And it's so easy, Allah. It's fun. Allah is fun and it's pleasure to have the guys coming to your country and you knock hells into Jaud Ma Ilam, Maro Salam, Maro. Right. Next one. Assalamualaikum. I just wanted to have your opinion about the rights in uh, Nigeria. Because there were Muslim and Christian rights and there were bloody rights. So what you say about that? What was actually the reason, uh, real reason behind it? Not on the face how many people died and how many people killed. The latest Times magazine. To get the latest Times magazine. You know Time magazine in America? They give you the reasons. They talk about militant evangelism by the Christians and Muslim fundamentalism. And the Muslim want to say we want to become Pakka Musliman, good Muslims, and the Christians want to change you to become Christians. And the poor Muslim doesn't know how to defend himself. So you lose your patience and you might want to hit the fellow and the guy hits you. This is not. The thing is now I say arm yourself intellectually that you will be itching say, Bhaiya, kaha jata hai? Where are you going? You see the mission. Come, 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 man. Come, let's have a cup of tea with me. And uska satyanas. You do the bloody job that the guy will never darken a Muslim's door again. Next one. Since the competition, I mean, Muslims are trying to uh, Islamize the Christians and non-Muslims. And Christians are also doing the same thing. Who is winning? In their attempt. Uh, the question is, if I understood it, that the Christians are trying to convert the Muslims, and the Muslims are also making effort to convert the Christians. Between the two, he wants to know who's winning. Is that the question? Well, it looks like the Christians are winning because we are not equipped. See, the Christian wants to come and have a dialogue with you. He wants to talk to you. They have developed new techniques. We are not in the field. Even the learned man. Here is some method I show you. What they're doing now? They come to you. They say, "Yeah, Sheikh, you believe in Jesus?" He said, "Of course. No Muslim is a Muslim if he doesn't believe in Jesus. It's a fact. You can't be a Muslim. We believe in all the prophets, right?" 
all the prophets. He said, you know, Jesus Christ was one of the mightiest messengers of God. What do you say? He says, yes, we accept that. You know, Jesus, he was born miraculously, without any male intervention. Do you accept that? He said, yes. Was your Muhammad born like that? He says, no. He was born like you and me. He says, yes, yes. That's all. Jesus is a degree above Muhammad. That's all. He didn't say that, but he proved it to you. He says, no, Jesus is the Christ, Messiah, Messiah. Right? He said, yes. Your prophet, was he Messiah, Messiah Christ? We said, no, he was Rasulullah. But he said, Isa is Rasul and Messiah in your Quran. Masihan ila Bani Israel. Rasulan ila Bani Israel. Masihu Isa ibn Maryam. That's what the Quran says. He's Masih and Rasul. Right? You said right. Your prophet is only Rasul. In the Quran. Right? You said right. Jesus is another degree above Muhammad. You know, Jesus, he gave life to the dead. He said, yes, Bismillah. He said, did Muhammad give life to the dead, Bismillah? He said, not that I know. Another degree for Jesus. Where is Jesus? You say in heaven. He's coming back. He said, yes. He's alive. He said, yes. He said, don't you? Where is your prophet Muhammad? You say he's buried in Medina. Perhaps his bones have rotted in the grave. He said, no, 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 no. We believe he's Hayatun Nabi. He said, that's metaphysically, metaphorically. But maybe physically his bones have rotted in the grave. He said, maybe. Another degree for Jesus. He said, don't you think God had a purpose in doing all that? He does things for nothing. Just like that. Without a purpose. You know, around the corner, a few days time, you're going to make Idul Adha. Kurbani, sheep, goat or a cow. Right? That's right. When you look for an animal, you look for an animal without blemish, no fault. Horn not broken, ear not cut, not blind, not limping. Right? That's right. See, so if God Almighty wants to make a sacrifice for his creation, is he going to look for second best? He says, no. When you look for the best for your kurbani, Allah, when he wants to make kurbani, you're going to look for second best? No. So he proved it to you who is, who is second best. Talk, talk, talk. No, there is, you are not equipped for that. This is not your job. You didn't do the job. For a thousand years, you didn't do the job. It's the easiest thing in the world to deal with this. Wallah. This little booklet here. That's the job. I've got a new title here called Desert Storm. Originally, if you have it, it might be Christ in Islam. It answers all what I told you. Easy, easy. Wallah, it's so easy. You can turn the tables on him just like that. But you didn't do the job. You don't want to do exercise. You want to take a pill and become a superman. Pahalwan banne chate, just by taking a pill. It doesn't work that way. You have to do exercise. Am I right? Dangal karna hai. You have to exercise and sweat and sweat and sweat. You don't have to sweat that much with this. You have the facts with you. Go to town, man. Go to town. And the books are available. Here in, uh, in, in, in Dubai, in Abu Dhabi. From my, if you can't get it, write to me in South Africa, you can get this book. This is Desert Storm. How does this come about? Desert Storm. This is a new title. Here, the Christians are getting through to us. Your question, who's winning? I say here, this is how they get through to you. You see this book here? It's written there, Desert Storm. The title of this book is Desert Storm. You have here the stamp of the American Army, Navy, Air Force. Army, Navy, Air Force. Uniform of the American soldier. And they want to give it to you. Free. Won't you like to have it? Free, free. You like to know how America got half a million men in the desert without getting hurt? That Saddam didn't throw even one bomb at the guys. Six months the guys kept on coming and coming. They built up half a million men and not one loss of not accident. By accident they lost a few. But nobody ever killed a single American soldier or the Allied coalition soldier. Not one. Then you like to know the Saddam's Scud missiles and how the American counteracted with the anti-patriot missiles. Do you like to know? No? Yes, free, free. Desert storm. And how they got Saddam out of Kuwait. Don't you like to know? Yeah, take it. What do you say? Thank you, thank you. Shukran. Thank you very much. You take it home. You open the book. What is it? The Holy Bible. <laughs> 
catch you. Look, they are working, they are working. But any deception, they will catch you fish. And they are catching fish. Don't be a fool. Say, no, it can't happen to us. I say, it's happening and it will happen. You have to be educated. You have to know how to deal with this. Yeah. No greater love. Look at this. No greater love. Don't you like to read it? Even an old fellow like me. Look, man. I passed that age now, but it's a like curiosity, man. I like to know something about love and romance. Don't you like to? Huh? The chairman says, I'm joking. <laughs> I'm not joking. I'm serious. <laughs> you take it home. Thank you. No greater love. If you open the book, what is it? Holy Bible. <laughs> The guy is working. The guy is working. I want to know what you're doing. I'm talking about a million Qurans that you can't help me. Look, so he said, look, you want to know who's winning? I said, look, that guy's winning. He's talking about 10 million Bibles will be given out now in South Africa. I'm talking about 1 million Zulu Qurans, two dollars $2 each. No, no, that you can't do. And you want to know who's winning? Yeah, another one. From Hong Kong. You go to the hotel, it says here, good news for visitors. In the hotel rooms, you get this good news for visitors. Don't you like to read, you know, about the Gisha girls, massage parlors? Don't you like to know? Huh? Now, man, how holy you are. You make salat in time, I know. But you have this in your bed bedroom, in the hotel. Won't you like to see what they're offering to you? Good news for visitors. Four color job. You open inside the Holy Bible in Chinese and English. Ha, ah, here. Yeah. Islam unveiled, Islam unveiled, written by the true desert storm. This is the true desert storm. Muhammad is the cause of all the trouble. And who is Muhammad? What they tell you here, it makes your blood boil. So what do you do? Go and shoot them, kill them? You need an answer. And the answer is these little pellets here. There are 19 other books here. These are books in comparative religion. Arm yourself with that knowledge and each and every Muslim should be able to give battle, man, to this Zahiruddin Mirza and the likes of him. And all these guys in the Gulf News and the likes of them. You should be in a position to talk. You, you, you. Every Muslim. is the bounden duty of every Muslim to arm himself with knowledge that you can give battle. If you don't, then what you deserve, you're getting what you deserve. I would uh, like to ask a question that is slightly away from tonight's topic, uh, but it's related to Dawa. Uh, people keep on coming up with questions that are designed to trip up when you talk to them about Islam. One of the questions that has been put very often is about witness in a court of law. They keep asking, why is it that two women are equal to one? And in these days of humanism, it is not easy to tell them that you just have to accept it on faith. We have to have an answer for it. I have not been able to find a good answer for it. I will try. I can't promise that it will satisfy anybody. But you ask the people, educated people. I said, you know, women, in the life cycle, they go through different stages. They have problems, like menstruation. And when they are under those conditions, they are not 100% balanced. Menopause. You read in the Time magazine about menopause. Just recently, the, the ones I'm talking about, menopause, the change of life. When that happens, what happens to the women? Mentally, intellectually, you know, they are unbalanced. Now you are going to put them in the witness box under those conditions. You're going to, don't going to ask, are you menstruating, lady? Huh? Before I question you, cross-examine you, you have borne witness against my, 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 my customer, my client. And now I want to cross-examine you. But before I cross-examine you, I want to know whether you are menstruating. <laughs> what will you say? Somebody asking your wife, are you menstruating? Huh? He says, man, I'll shoot the guy, man, damn it, you want to know about my wife, what's her period in, in her life, you know, the monthly period, you talk about that? No, but we know for a fact, these physiologists will tell you that the woman is not the same throughout her life, throughout the whole month. There are fluctuations in her bodily reactions to problems. Menopause, again, problems. Now, under those circumstances, you are unjust to the woman by putting her to the stress, same as the man. Therefore, is the two women are to support each other in the evidence, and we will count it as one because of that, that weakness on her part. 
Not that we are looking down upon her, but the poor thing needs help and support. Yes, my son. Last question. Mr. Dita, I would like to ask you a separate question, a bit out of the way. Uh, some nine years back, one Parsi gentleman, he put forward this question to me and I couldn't give him a reply. He said that whether it is Islam, a Christianity, a Jewish religion, it has started with incest. That is why I thought about this question again when you talked about incest. He's saying during Adam alayhi salam, his son and daughter got married. Now what answer you have to about this? He's saying your religions have all started with incest. That is what the Parsi gentleman told me. Now what is your answer for this? A logical answer. Well, look, as, as far as I know, I wasn't there. But since you are committing incest now, there's so much incest in all the Western world. See, you read the figures given by the Americans. The amount of incest they're committing with their own daughters. And not grown-up daughters, three-year and five-year-olds. Right? He said, look, now here, you have a problem here now. Don't worry about million years ago, what happened and how it started. I don't know. I was not there. But I will ask, find out. When we go on the other side, we'll go and find out from Allah. Say, Ya Baritala, how did you get the things going? You know? <laughs> so, I said, look, you have a little patience. In the mo at the moment, you, your people are committing incest. Wholesale. Almost every nation you find that the incest rate is going up and up and up. Child molestation is going up and up and up. We are worried about that. Now, I want to know what you're going to do with the guys. Your law, what does it say? You Americans, you Christians, you Buddhists, I want to know what does your law say about the man who commits incest with his daughter. What do you do? As Islam says, chop off his head. Right? I said, look, Islam has an answer. You, I want to know what you have to say. Whether what Adam did and his son Cain and Abel did, I said, look, I don't know. I don't want to know. Nothing, the Quran doesn't say anything about that they married the sisters or what and what not. I don't know. I haven't seen it. So, I'm not interested. I'm interested in you. Whether you are committing incest. And since you are so interested, it looks like that is not, it's, it's on your tongue. I use it because I said the Bible is full of incest. Four different types of incest in the first book of the Bible. Different types of incest. incest. It's, is now educating you what what you can do. So I said, ah, such a book is going to do you harm. It's going to program you. Therefore, keep away from it. George Bernard Shaw, he said, the most dangerous book on earth. George Bernard Shaw. He said, keep it under lock and key. Your children must not have access to it. And the Plain Truth magazine, it tells you that many a censor, censor will give the Bible an X rating. And it is very good for teaching sex to children. You know, you're going to start the subject of sex. The Bible is the book. So, the guy put the turn to the table on the fellow. He said, I don't know why you are lapping up sinces, sinces. Maybe somewhere along the line you want to justify it. That's what, the reason is you want to justify. Your great grandfather, million years ago, if they committed incest, that means it's justifiable to you. Is that your reason for asking the question? No, no, no. He asked, that's what I'm telling him. Is that your reason? As the Islam says, chop off your head. Now before I declare this meeting closed, I have to uh, first of all thank uh, the Department of Awqaf um, uh, and Islamic Affairs, Government of Sharjah, the Department of uh, Culture, Government of Sharjah for making this uh, meeting possible at a very very short notice. We have also to thank you, to thank uh, the Sharjah Television. FM Radio, Abu Dhabi Radio, Umar Khoyan Radio, who announced about this meeting from time to time this morning or throughout the day, which informed our brethren here to come here, despite the fact that we could not put an announcement in the newspapers about this lecture. Then, I, my grateful thanks to Sheikh Ahmed Didad to accept our request to, to be present here today and uh, give us the benefit of his um, experience and his knowledge. And I'm also grateful to all you ladies and gentlemen for listening uh, patiently in this heat and uh, enjoying this lecture. Thank you very much all, ladies and gentlemen. So, uh, can we have some short for the TV?
maybe from this book can you take some shots about the books why not made? why not come on why not just we do not have just one second they want you to take a shot for the tv yes 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 yes